Hello, friends, and welcome back to Breaking Bread for You. Now, most of us have contemplated doing Aliyah to Jerusalem, yet few have ever considered the greatest of all Aliyahs, the return of the Jews from the Babylonian exile. Actually, there were three Aliyahs, the first taking place in 538 BC, when King Cyrus of Persia decreed that all Jews in exile were liberated to return to their homeland and to rebuild their temple and to reestablish the Torah prescribed worship of Yehovah. Cyrus commissioned Sheshbazar, the fourth son of the last king of Judah, Jehoiakim, to lead the Jews to Judah, which numbered 42,560 men, plus women and children, and over 7,000 servants. The second Aliyah of around 5,000 people occurred in 458 BC under the leadership of Ezra the priestly scribe, who was commissioned by King Artaxerxes to teach the law of God to the people in Trans-Euphrates region of his empire. And the third and last major Aliyah occurred in 13 years later in 445 BC, when Artaxerxes allowed his cupbearer, Nehemiah, to return to Judah to rebuild the walls, taking with him an undisclosed number of people. Now, what we know about the 6th century post-exilic returns and the rebuilding of the temple is found in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, with additional information given in the books of the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And we can say that history, this history, is structured around the decrees of four kings, beginning with Cyrus. The second, Ahasuerus, the king was manipulated by the Samaritan opposition to halt the rebuilding of the temple. The third, Darius, who reversed Ahasuerus's orders and decreed that the reconstruction resume in 520 BC. And the last, Artaxerxes, who commissioned Ezra to go and teach Torah to the people in the Trans-Euphrates region in 458 BC and who later released Nehemiah in 445 BC to rebuild the city walls. Although Cyrus's degree was a huge breakthrough for the Jews in exile, from the difficulties the returnees experienced, we can learn that breakthroughs are not always easy. And we should have learned that from the greatest breakthrough of the exodus of the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery, taken 40 years for them to finally enter the land of promise, and it was only their children who did so. Now, let me say that as long as I can remember, my favorite character in the Bible has been Ezra, author of the book that bears his name, and the book of Nehemiah, originally counted as one work in the Hebrew version, which scholars suggest also included the book of Chronicles. Unfortunately, few of us are familiar with Ezra's life and accomplishments, with most favoring the illustrious characters of the Bible, such as Samson, David, and Esther. Yet he was nonetheless accomplished. Ezra has been highly esteemed by both ancient and modern rabbis, who have argued that he was worthy to have received the Torah had Moses not preceded him. So, I am going to give you a synopsis of the life and legacy of Ezra, the priestly scribe, against the backdrop of the times and events in which he lived. The late 6th century BC was a most glorious time for the Jews after 70 years of captivity, when they were liberated to return to their homeland to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in the siege of Jerusalem. And those who returned came with a great zeal for the reconstruction and reestablishment of Torah prescribed temple worship that those who were born in exile had only heard about from their parents and grandparents. Now, you might have noticed that the time span between the siege of Jerusalem in 586 to 587 and their first Aliyah in uh, around 537 amounts to just 50 years not the 70 years of captivity foretold by the prophet Jeremiah. This can be explained, however, in that Nebuchadnezzar had been deporting Jews from Israel for almost 20 years prior to the great deportation. 
In fact, Daniel had been exiled to Babylon in the earlier deportation of 605. And historians agree that it had not been so bad for the Jewish captives in Babylon as it had been for the Hebrews during their enslavement in Egypt. Actually, many Jews prospered in Babylon to the extent that most chose not to return to Judah when liberated by King Cyrus. After Nebuchadnezzar had a revelation that Adonai is the true God of creation, Daniel 4, 37, Jews were allowed to gather and worship in synagogues they established throughout the Babylonian Empire, where in the absence of the temple, their focus shifted to the study and exposition of Torah. It is assumed that the synagogue emerged during the Babylonian exile. Adonai had formally spoken through the prophet Isaiah about the king, and I quote, while saying to Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose. While saying to Jerusalem, you will be built and to the temple, your foundation will be laid. Isaiah 44, 28. The edict of Cyrus was the answer to decades of earnest repentance and prayer, mocking the end of their chastisement they had earned from their apostasy and contempt of Torah. Prophets of ancient Israel had foretold of their eventual return to the land, including Moses in Deuteronomy 31, 15 and 16, and Isaiah chapters 40 through 66, and most of the other prophets from Jeremiah to Malachi, who understood that although Adonai is just, he is also merciful who would not chastise his people forever. And that chastisement began on the 8th of Av, 587 BC, when 4,200 Jews were slain, the temple leveled, and around 20,000 taken captive to Babylon, with 60,000 of the poor remaining in the land to manage the vineyards and the orchards. Jeremiah foretold that the Jews would return after 70 years. He even wrote about burying the deed to his uncle's property in a clay jar where it could be retrieved when the Judahites would eventually return to the land to redeem their ancestral properties, Jeremiah 32. Yet Jeremiah's message of hope came with the condition that the returnees live Torah observant lives particularly in regard to Sabbath keeping and the eternal ownership of property, as well as caring for the poor amongst them. Now in this frame is a clay cylinder discovered in 1879 in the ruins of Babylon. That is inscribed in Akkadian cuneiform script concerning Cyrus's conquest of the Babylonian empire ruled by Nabonidus, Babylon's last king. It is further decreed that all captives throughout the kingdom, without any mention of the Jews or Jerusalem, were free to return to their cities to rebuild their temples. This indicates that the Persians invested much in restoring the shrines of the various peoples taken captive by the Babylonians, who had systematically destroyed their cultic centers as a means of subduing and controlling them. Now it has been suggested that Cyrus funded the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple as a means of establishing law and order in Judah, which at the time was quite chaotic, known to be a dangerous place to live, as the first Jewish returnee soon discovered. In addition to religious freedom, Persia allowed Judah a measure of self-governance in what they refer to as Yehud Medinata, Aramaic for province of Judah. And that name stuck for the state of Israel is currently referred to as Medina Israel. Judah was even allowed to have their own coinage as seen in the lower left-hand corner of the, this frame. And about their religion, 
the persians followed the zoroastrian religion the worship of mazda along with the teachings of the prophet zoroaster we know that the persians were tolerant of other religions which benefited the jews and that they could freely practice judaism throughout the empire the persian rulers most likely understood that in allowing people to worship as they choose that they could gain their loyalty and peaceful coexistence among the various peoples interestingly zoroastrianism shares some of the beliefs of judaism including monotheism the belief in one god the belief in an afterlife a heaven for the good and a hell for the evil and a savior who is coming to make all things right which might have been instilled by queen esther during the time many persians converted to judaism now ezra indicates in chapter one that the tribes represented in the first return were judah benjamin and the levites and the names of the returnees are listed there by family designation that numbered around 50,000. Yet many more Jews remained behind, either being too old for the journey, too young, or too comfortable, not wanting to give up what they had worked hard for in captivity. Furthermore, the Jews had been well protected in exile, and knowing from officials and merchants how dangerous and desolate Jerusalem was, many declined the offer to do Aliyah. Also, Ezra listed in chapter 2 the leaders who made Aliyah with governor Sheshbazar, and they are Zerubbabel, who later took over as governor, Yeshua, the high priest, and Nehemiah, who returned to Persia, later making a second Aliyah for the purpose of rebuilding the walls of the city. And other leaders were Setreah, Realeah, and Mordecai presumably Queen Esther's cousin, and five other elders. Now, Sheshbazar seems to have been abruptly replaced by Zerubbabel, without any explanation from Ezra as to why. All that the text reveals is that they were governors in charge of laying the temple's foundation, perhaps with the former beginning the project and the latter completing it. And as soon as they had cleared away the rubble to lay the foundation and began to offer up sacrifices to Jehovah, hostile Samaritans conspired to have the rebuilding of the temple shut down, Ezra 3.3. In spite of the support of Persia and the sound leadership of Zerubbabel, Samaritan opposition managed to bring the reconstruction to a halt for 17 years until the prophets Haggai and Zechariah told them they were to continue to rebuild regardless. And so the work resumed. Again, the Samaritans appealed to the king, this one being Darius, who after inquiring about Cyrus's edict, decreed to the opposition to not only stop hindering the reconstruction, but to financially support it under the threat of being impaled, Ezra 6.11. So the temple referred to as either the second temple or Zerubbabel's temple was completed in three years in 516 BC, about 20 years after the initial return of the Jews. And it was then that Passover, as prescribed by Moses in Exodus 12, was observed for the first time in 50 years, Ezra 6:19. Unfortunately, the elders who had worshipped at Solomon's temple were disappointed, for it did not have the size and grandeur of the first temple, as you can see in this frame. Nor did it house the Ark of the Covenant that mysteriously disappeared in the siege of Jerusalem. That all said, let's take a look at Ezra, the son of Sarah, the Levitical priestly scribe, who, as his genealogy attests, was a descendant of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the brother of Moses, Ezekiel 7, 1 through 5. And he wrote of himself in the third person, saying, He was a scribe skilled in the Torah of Moses that Adonai, the God of Israel, had given. 
Furthermore, Ezra wanted his audience to know that Adonai's hand was on him because he studied Torah, he obeyed it, and he taught it. Ezekiel 7, 9, and 10. And although the timing of Ezra's return to the land has been debated, most historians agree that it was when Esther was queen of Persia with either Artaxerxes I or his successor and son Artaxerxes II ruling over the empire. Whatever the case, we can say that besides saving her people from extinction, Esther might have influenced the king to commission Ezra to go and teach the Torah. And that commission is recorded in Ezra in a letter, one of the most important writings from one of the greatest kings in history that we have in the Bible. And in chapter 7, beginning in verse 11, it is written, now, this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the Cohen, the scribe, a teacher of matters pertaining to the mitzvot, the commandments of Adonai, and his statutes over Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the Cohen, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven. I have now issued a decree that anyone in my kingdom from the people of Israel even the Kohanim and Levites who wish to go up to Jerusalem with you may go, for you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire about Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and to bring silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely given to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem together with all the silver and gold that you find in the whole province of Babylon, as well as the free will offerings of the people and the Kohanim for the house of their God in Jerusalem. Furthermore, with this silver, you should be sure to buy bulls, rams, and lambs, along with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. You may do whatever seems good to you and your brothers with the remaining silver and gold according to the will of your God. Obviously, Artaxerxes was not only well advised about Judaic temple sacrifice, but was willing to generously support it. And his letter goes on to say in verse 19, the vessels that are entrusted to you for the service of the house of your God deliver before the God of Jerusalem the rest of the needs of the house of your God that you may have occasion to supply, you may provide from the royal treasury. I, King Artaxerxes, hereby issue a decree to all the treasurers of Trans-Euphrates to diligently provide all that Ezra the Cohen, scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may ask of you, up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of oil, and salt without limit. Everything that the God of heaven has required, let it be done with diligence for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be any wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Amazingly, the king expresses a fear of the God of the Jews and that if he doesn't generously give to the temple efforts, his wrath will fall on him and his sons. The king also wrote to the Persian officials in the region saying, we also notify you that you have no authority to impose tribute, tax, or duty on any of the Kohanim, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, sanctuary servants, or attendants at this house of God. And to Ezra the king continued to write, Now you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint judges and magistrates who may administer justice to all the people in trans-Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God, and you ought to teach those who do not know them. Let anyone who does not observe the law of your God and the law of the king be punished with due diligence, whether it is death or banishment, confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Now, keep that thread in mind, for it factors into what was about to happen in Jerusalem. And so Ezra 
responded to this letter saying in verse 27, Blessed be Adonai, the God of our fathers, who has put it into the heart of the king to beautify the house of Adonai in Jerusalem in this way, and who has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors and all the king's mighty princes. I gained strength as the hand of Adonai my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Ezra 7, 11 through 24. Now, may I suggest that Artaxerxes had sent Ezra to Judah to teach the law of God, not only under the leading of the Holy Spirit, but with the understanding that enforcing the observance of Torah under the threat of death would result in peace and security throughout the region. In chapter 8, Ezra listed the priests and elders along with their sons he chose to return with by way of the route shown in the spring, but he found that there were no Levites among them. So he sent off 12 leaders to go and gather them. Chapter 8, verse 15 through 17, who returned with 38 Levites and 220 sanctuary servants. Verses 18 through 20. Here we see how Adonai provided absolutely everything needed for the temple worship, but there was more. Before leaving, Ezra proclaimed a fast at the Ahava River camp for Adonai's protection from robbers and murderers. Verses 21 and 23. Evidently, he had been too embarrassed to ask the king for military assistance for protection, not wanting the king to think that their God was unable to protect them. The safe arrival of Ezra and the people would have been a witness for the king of Adonai's love for his people, and that it was truly Adonai's plan that the Torah be taught in Judah, and his will that the king would support that effort. So Ezra and the leaders, Levites and their sons, began the Aliyah on the first day of the first month of Nisan, arriving safe and sound five months later in Av, late August. And as soon as they arrived, they did what Torah-observing Jews did. They offered up burnt sacrifices to Adonai in thanksgiving for all that he had done for them. But Ezra's joy was short-lived when he was informed that the men of the temple community, even the high priests, had divorced their Jewish wives in order to marry foreign women who did not convert to Judaism. Like Solomon, the men were drawn to the religious beliefs and practices of their pagan wives, and their sons were not taught Hebrew, thus could not be instructed in Torah. Judaism had once again been syncretized with false and idolatrous religion which caused the destruction of the temple and Judah's deportation in the first place. And Ezra's response was extreme, tearing out his hair and sobbing uncontrollably. And when the men saw his reaction, they were moved to repentance and promised to send their wives and offspring back to where they came from. And if you think that this was harsh, Think how horrible it would have been for them to have been executed by order of the king for not keeping Torah. That forbids intermarriage with those unwilling to convert. And you can find that in Exodus 34, 16 and Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6. It is to wonder if the men sincerely repented or complied out of fear of execution. And Ezra did what he is most known for, implementing social religious reform that was accepted by most of the men of the temple community, which resulted in the observance of a Torah-based Judaism. From this arose a class of priests dedicated to Torah observance, considered by some to be the beginning of the Phariseean movement. Yet Ezra's reform did not last long, for 13 years later, when Nehemiah returned to rebuild the walls, he discovered that some had divorced their wives to marry foreign women. 
A contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah, Malachi the prophet exposed Judah's social injustice, idolatry, and intermarriage. It was as horrifying to Malachi as it was to Ezra and Nehemiah that the Jews, even the priests, had returned to the sin that caused Adonai's chastisement of the destruction of the temple and deportations. And Malachi rebuked these wayward priests for this and other offenses, saying, For a Cohen's lips should God knowledge, and instruction must be sought from his mouth, for he is a messenger of Adonai Zavaot. But you have turned from the way. You cause many to stumble in Torah by the instruction. You corrupted the covenant of the Levites, says Adonai Zavaot. So I also have made you despise and lowly to all the people, because you are not keeping my ways, but show favoritism in Torah. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously, a man against his brother, defiling the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, an abomination done in Israel, even in Jerusalem. For Judah has defiled Adonai's sanctuary, which he loves, and married the daughter of a foreign god. Adonai will cut off the man who does this until he is cast from the tents of Jacob and from offering a gift to Adonai Zabaoth. And when Malachi says that Judah has acted treacherously, he's talking about doing away with their Jewish wives for no apparent reason, in order to marry pagan women. Whether these women were wealthy or more beautiful, it is not said. Yet to divorce Jewish wives to marry pagan women was utter defiance of Torah, and they knew that. And I quote De Deuteronomy 7, beginning in verse 2, where it forbade the Hebrews entering Canaan to, you are to make no covenant with them and to show no mercy to them. You are not to intermarry with them. You are not to give your daughter to his son or take his daughter for your son, for he will turn your son away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of Adonai will be kindled against you and he will swiftly destroy you. But unlike Ezra, when Nehemiah discovered that the men married foreign women, he did not pull out his hair, but rightfully pulled out the hair of the defiant men. Further, Nehemiah discovered that the temple community were not taking care of the poor Jewish families, and so he implemented economic reforms to assist them. Like Ezra, Governor Nehemiah is accredited with social religious reforms. But can we say that they stuck? I'm not so sure they did, given that Israel went from one foreign dominance after another, from the Greeks to the Romans to the Ottomans. But what can be said is that Nehemiah accomplished what he came to do, and that is to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in spite of the opposition to do so he encountered. Nehemiah's reconstructed walls are seen in this frame, colored in gray, alongside the modern walls in white that were built by Suleiman the Great of the 11th century AD. And in the book of Nehemiah, one of the most momentous occasions is told, and that is Ezra reading the Torah to all the people during the fall feast, Nehemiah 8. And at the end of the feast, the people separated themselves from all foreigners and gathered to repent, worship, and hear the Torah read. This resulted in a commitment to obey Torah and the renewal of the covenant, Nehemiah 9. And I quote, now, because of all of this, we are making a binding agreement in writing, and the names of our leaders, our Levites and our Kohanim, are affixing their seals on the document. On the seal document were the names of all the priests. And resuming in verse 29, it says, Now the rest of the people, the Kohanim, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the people of the lands for the sake of the Torah of God, along with their wives, their sons and their daughters, who were able to understand, all join their brothers, the nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in the Torah of God, given through Moses, the servant of God, 
and to keep and do all the mitzvot of Adonai, our Lord, along with his ordinances and his statutes. Furthermore, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land, and we will not take their daughters for our sons. When the peoples of the land bring merchandise or any kind of grain on Sabbath, we will not buy from them on Sabbath or on a holy day. Also, every seventh year, we will forego working the land and the debt of every hand. We also assume responsibility for the mitzvot to give a third of a shekel each year for the work of the house of our God. For the rose of bread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, for the Moedim, the festivals, for the holy things, for the sin offerings to atone for Israel and for all the service of the house of God. And I close by saying that there is more. So I hope that you will take the time to read through Ezra and Maya to discover that. And while you do, bear in mind two things from this study. First, ancient Israel, like all of us, was their own worst enemy. By not obeying the commandments of Yehovah, they subjected themselves to his long-term chastisement. And secondly, on a positive note, the persistence and endurance demonstrated by Yehovah's righteous servants, Zerubbabel, Joshua the high priest, Ezra and Nehemiah, when challenged by the opposition, became a model for the generations that followed. And may I say, be blessed in all that you do according to the commandments of Adonai that you keep.